Oh, that's my home in Ohio. It's called Gibbonville. Ah, no way out there. Where? I live there. In San Francisco? Yep. I'm with the way that I am. That's the bus route from Gibbonville to Columbus to Boston and then to Gloucester, where I got off at the shipyard. What did C stand for? C is where I had to change buses. And that? Hamburger. Me? <laughs> I missed that. I fell asleep. And when I got up here to Gloucester, I ran out of land, so I stopped. What you need, the map of the ocean. You can work on this. Hey, oh boy, it's just like yours. Yep. We went all the way here, then over here, and all the way down here. That's where we are today. This morning, we came up here, and now I'm up to date. guys, it's time to... Arthur, what are you doing up? You had the mid-watch. <laughs> I'm anxious, man. It's been tossing for the last hour. Anxious for what? Port, land, civilization, people, video games, you name it.
How am I doing? <laughs> oh, great. Right on course. Just trying to find out how long it'll take us to get to Rockland. Boy, everyone sure is itchy to get on land. Well, aren't you? Yeah, I kind of like it out here. Yep. I know what you mean. Zip. Zilch. Zero. Doc just left to eat in this place. There's always peanut butter. No, it's still a little early for a dip in your mud bucket. We've gone through almost 25 pounds of this stuff. Oh, don't remind me. My mouth sticks together just thinking about it. Mom says he's gonna catch fish for dinner. Right. Arthur, I got a present for you. Welcome. I know what I'll be doing today. What time do you get to want, man, TT? About four. Oh, this whale's not in the fluke oh. catalog. Oh, now this is a good-looking whale. <laughs> That's the guy she can't wait to see again? Eric? Yep. He works with Ramon in the Institute. He's gonna meet us at the dock. Look at this, CT. What is that? It's a humpback, eating. Looks all swollen. Well, he's filled with about 15 or 20 tons of water and little fish. CT, they have folds in the skin so it can stretch like an accordion. Do they swallow all the water, too? Nope. They strain it out through their baleen, this, like, curtain that hangs down from the top of their mouths. Where are their teeth? Humpbacks don't have any teeth. They push the water out with their tongues, and the little fish get trapped inside. It's getting shallower. That must be Jeffrey's bank. Oh, oops, I've got to take the water temperature. Arthur, are you going to use the computer? No, I can do these by. Right, thanks. Sure. Hey, Ann, we're at the bank. We should start dropping XBTs. OK, but get CT to help you. We've got to go over these census data before we meet with Eric. I'll give you a hand, Rage. No way, man. I would give my last pair of dry socks for fresh fish. You just keep at it. <laughs> hey, CT, will you bring me some of those XVTs? <laughs> I give up. There isn't a fish within 50 kilometers of here. Weather conditions are all wrong. Yeah, humpback, and they eating your fish. <laughs> I... Shall we take a look? Let's go. What about my XBT readings? Start them. This is a good chance to match water temperature with feeding behavior. Oh, right. CT, you've watched me do this. First, you take the cap off. Then, you put the cylinder in the launch room. Then you pull this lever down to lock it. That makes contact between this wire to the computer and the wire inside that's connected to the sensor. Then when I tell you, you pull this pin, the sensor drops out and it reports the temperature as it falls through the water. Get it? Got it. Good. the ground. Oh, all right. There, hit bottom. I don't get this. Well, this is the depth along here. The further along it is, the deeper, see? 10 meters, 20 meters. And this line is the temperature. You can see how the water gets cooler as the sensor gets deeper. 
Uh, so that's where I hit bottom. Yeah. That means that the bottom is 42 meters deep, and the temperature down there is a little over 6 degrees Celsius. Right. Cold water is denser, so it usually sinks to the bottom. Let's see. Are you going to do another one too? Oh. You want me to take another? Yep. I'll tell you when to let it go. Okay. Are we getting close to the whales? Hmm. You're doing another FBT? Yep. Do you just leave those things down at the bottom of the ocean? It's a water temperature taker we can just throw away. But that's littering. That's true. But I figure what we can learn about the ocean is worth that little bit of litter. Now, CT! Looks great! Hey, wait a minute. It's getting warmer. Now it's getting colder. What's going on? We're getting closer. Ready for the last one, CT? Anytime. OK, let her go. Quick, Arthur, look at that. What is that? It's a bubble cloud. Now watch. We think they make the bubbles to force the fish to group closely together. Is it a bird? I don't think so. They're smart critters. Look at that. I got you, baby. Now look. It'll squeeze the water out the side of its mouth through the baleen and keep the fish inside. That'll be enough for now. Wow! Fantastic! Bubble feeding! What are they eating? Sandlands? Yep. In other places, they eat different kinds of fish and little things like shrimp called krill. Here is Sandlands. There's the baleen, CT. Look, she's going down for a second helping. Oh, there's some fishermen, all right. Speaking of fishermen, Ramon, have you caught dinner yet? Oh, I'm a bugger. <laughs> all right. Watch out. The evening in the brown. Not peanut butter for dinner. That's better so again, than... For dinner, how about my specialty? Rice, Rice, Rice and beans. beans. I think I'll go spell Sally Ruth at the helm. Oh, Arthur, do me a favor, will you, buddy? Stole my fishing gear, I left it up on deck. Sure. Thanks. I bet you those fish are heaving a huge sigh of relief. <laughs> time looking at whales. We also spend a lot of time looking for whales to look at. The people here study all kinds of marine animals, but they do it mostly in these buildings, and the animals that they study are brought to them. I'm Mary Tanner, and this is the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. The laboratories were established here nearly a hundred years ago to study biology and natural history. About 75 scientists carry on research at Woods Hole, even more in the summer when courses are open to students from around the world. What they learn can help us protect marine life and the ocean environment. But the goal of these scientists is not only to learn more about sea creatures, 
It's also to learn what those creatures can teach us about ourselves. Animals like sea urchins and crabs and clams are the unsung heroes of the work at Woods Hole. Many of these species have evolved with physical systems similar to our own, but often simpler and therefore easier to study. From them, scientists have learned more about human biology, like how nerves work, how cells divide, and how our bodies fight disease. The laboratories were established in Woods Hole because it is near a great crossroads of ocean currents and marine habitats. Marshes, bays, and deep waters are all close at hand. But the ocean animals don't just swim into the labs. Someone's got to collect them. The head of the collection department was my host at Woods Hole. His name is John Valois. Are you come here to see some marine animals? Oh, yeah. Well, well, yeah why don't we go in and we'll see what we have? All right. Come. I'm ready. Yeah. Mary, this is called the supply department. Some of our scientists refer to it as the, the worm works. <laughs> and this is where all of the specimens come that are collected by our collectors, our boats, scuba diving, dredges, nets, and all that kind of thing. And these animals are placed in these tanks, these environmental tanks, for holding purposes until they're sent up to the scientists. John gave me a quick tour of the holding tanks. These funny looking fish are called sea robins. I guess because their fins look more like wings. They also have what look like legs, but they're really for finding food. Fish would want to walk. No. <laughs> well, okay, some fish have to live on the bottom of the ocean to get its food. Mm -hmm. And this animal is able, this fish is able to use those chemoreceptors, these are very, very sensitive cells at the tip of the walking legs. And by scratching along and using the chemoreceptors, they're able to find their food. So chemoreceptors really are special cells that react to certain chemicals. We have them too. They give us our sense of taste and smell. Studying the sea robin might teach us something about how our own senses work. We don't want to be cruel to our animals. <laughs> Over 10,000 squid are also caught each year for the labs. This animal, we'll refer to as the ice cream cone of the animal kingdom, in which <laughs> almost everything in the ocean feeds on it. Uh, these are called cephalopods. This is the central region of the brain, and these are the feet. So cephalopod meaning head, foot, which is a very strange creature that yeah. it has its head and its foot in the same place. Uh -huh. Now, can you tell me any sensations that you have as you hold on to this? He's re it's really smooth. Very smooth, yes. And it's got yes. some slime. slime yeah, which is slimy. true almost of everything that lives in the ocean. They have this protection from bacteria that might penetrate the out, outer skin. Can you see this animal with its chromatophores, these pigments that are now changing color? Yeah. These are used to protect the animal from being attacked by large predators. And they're able to go from browns to reds to blacks to whites. And can you imagine a thousand of these animals all together changing color to confuse, oh, yeah. to confuse their predators? It's a very fine system for protective coloration. Squid have an interesting way to move around. They take in water and squirt it out so fast it's like a little jet rocket. The nerve cells that control that pumping action are similar to nerve cells in our bodies, but they're much larger, so they're easier for the scientists to study. We can thank the squid for a lot of what we know about how nerves work and for new ways to treat diseases of the nervous system. Next stop, horseshoe crabs. This species has been around for about 500 million years, and they're so well adapted that they've hardly changed for 200 million years. They look more dangerous than they are, but their stinger-like tails seem like a weapon to me. It must be. It must be a, a protection device. Well, of some it, kind. it looks like it should be. What happens if this animal falls over and cannot turn itself back up to go the, feed? Yeah. So, so, what do you suppose that does? Tail. Yes, that's leverage. right. The telson works to get caught in a rock or sand, uh -huh. flip the animal back, and so it can go to feed again. Oh, I see. But part of your answer is correct because the American Indians would take the telson from these crabs, tie it to a spear, and use it as a weapon or use it to uh, uh, get prey. Uh -huh. They discovered at Woods Hole that the blood from horseshoe crabs can be used to detect some dangerous human diseases. The creamy blue blood clots when it comes in contact with poisons called endotoxins, made by certain bacteria. After a portion of their blood is drained, the horseshoe crabs are returned to the sea where they will make new blood. 
Some of the animals aren't so lucky, but they all contribute to a better understanding of our natural world. As John showed me the list of animals we would be after on this day, he got a last minute order from Woods Hole scientist, Dr. Judith Grassley. So I put sea urchins and worms, capitella. Capitella. Ross, should I get my coat on? Are we going to go? Yeah, sure. Yep. Well, I guess you're leaving All right we, away. So yep, there you we, go. The engine's warmed and Have we're a good ready trip. to go. Thanks. So how far are we going out? We're going to go about three or four miles. And what I thought we'd like to do today is look at some of the diversity of animals, how they've adapted to their environments, things that they, they can do. Uh, this is the research vessel, RV oh, Gemma. Wow. And up aboard, and I'll oh, introduce great. you to the crew. In the course of a year, John collects over 75,000 animals right. of 200 different species. He needs to know how to recognize all these species, and he also has to know where to find them. Some animals can live in a wide range of environmental conditions, but most species have evolved to fit a certain kind of environment, and they can't survive in other places. John waited for a place where he knew the bottom was sandy before he used the dredge for the first time. In just a few minutes, we had our first sample, a pile of typical sandy bottom sea creatures. This clump of sand is actually built by a colony of animals and provides a home for little worms that have evolved to live in such a place. We also needed another kind of worm, called a hydroides, which survives on the sandy bottom by attaching itself to a clamshell. Look, this one's got some of this attached to it. Should, it just, should we just take the whole thing or try to pull it apart? Well, why don't you take it off, because we won't need that. Okay. We've got some ex oh, that's good. Very fine. Okay, Very right. nice. Yeah, that's got a right. lot on that side. Yeah. The next animals on our list couldn't live on a flat sandy bottom because they've evolved to hold onto rocks. We arrived at the next site and lowered the dredge again. Within minutes, we had a sample of the rocky bottom below. Yeah, good work. That's hey, it. That's look. it. Yeah. yeah. Some urchins for Dr. Grassley. That's right. That's <laughs> why we came, Mary. Uh, we'll just. It's over here. I'm going to just give you one of these to hold for a second okay. and examine it. The urchins have developed suction tubes for feet to hold on to the rocks. They wouldn't work very well on shifting sand. Well, if, if it sat here long enough on my hand like this, would it attach itself? Yes, it would. Yes. Yeah. Would it be easy to get it? It would just come right off well, if I pulled yeah, it off? Well, it would, it would no? recognize that the tube feet are not on the kind of thing that they normally... Uh, they would, it would know immediately that your hand is not a rock. Yeah. But it would attach. Yeah. Yeah. I think Dr. Grassley will be really pleased with this collection. Of yes, questions. yes, it's it's a good collection. Uh, it'll be just just fine for what she wants to do in her research. Great. Well, all right. With, we'll we'll just take some of these animals out. These boats are very able. Our last stop, where we could stop, find a muddy bottom, stable, was several miles away. Yeah. Well, I think the scientists are really lucky to have someone like you to go collecting for them. Mary, it's very nice of you to say something <laughs> like that. We, we have to have a relationship with fishermen just as we have to have a relationship with scientists. So we're in between. We have to know what scientists are doing in order to uh, give them the kind of specimens they need. But we also have to know how the fisherman does it in order to be able to collect the, uh, the type of animals they need. We have to know the environment. What the fishermen do know? Yeah. Hadley's Harbor had the mud we needed in order to complete the day's work. We're gonna need the, uh, it wasn't the prettiest the sight in the world. Over the side, Charlie, with it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like we'll get anything out of this. Well, Mary, it's a completely different environment. It really is. It looks so different from the other two. Uh, Dress. It's very rich in life, though. Let's just have a look and see what we can find. Really smells. Well, uh, <laughs> smells the like smell it. is hydrogen sulfide, which is a waste product of a lot of things that once were living. But even though that this looks like a very dead uh, environment, it's full of life. Oh, there's right there, Mary. There. It's sort of hard to get at them with these gloves, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe you can take your gloves off. Okay. <laughs> That's a levocardium. Isn't that a very pretty shell? Yes. You notice how? Yes. It off. Yes. Uh, and that is it's a yellow very, and, and that's brown. That's a primary part of the uh, 
of this ecosystem. And now I would like you to notice how delicate the shell is when the animal lives in mud, because it doesn't, it does not have the, uh, the strain of having to resist rocks or sand. Hey, hey, I think I know, I see something. Uh, it's a worm. There. Just hold right onto it, all right? Oh, good. <laughs> oh, uh, this, this is called a beak thrower. Now, the beak thrower uses its proboscis, which is part of its mouth, to work its way through the mud. There's the beak, mm -hmm. and in a minute, it'll explode. It's building, there Woo! it goes. And that's its system for working through the mud. Oh my God. Yes, and that also attacks its prey that way. I could see why this little worm belonged in the mud. Imagine how her head would feel if she tried to get around that way on a rocky bottom. All right, well, it would have been nice to have found more tube worms, but I think we've got what we need. We'll just put everything in the bucket, and I think we're almost ready to leave. Okay. All right. John and his crew are out practically every day, and skin divers help them in the warmer months. They're careful not to take more of any species than the population can reproduce. It was a fun day and a successful collecting trip. All the orders were filled. As we came back to the laboratory docks, I couldn't help wondering whether one of these little animals I helped catch could be the key to a breakthrough in medical science. That strange little worm, or those prickly urchins, might give us a whole new understanding of ourselves and our world. Thank you.